Thank you everyone for joining our Summer Career Series event. Today, we will be talking about ITINs and EINs. I want to introduce you to today's speaker, which is Professor Francine Littman. Professor Francine Littman is a professor of law at UNLV's Boyd School of Law. Her areas of expertise include tax law and taxation of business entities. Professor Littman is a frequent speaker on tax subjects to law and business groups and works with undocumented immigrants, including entrepreneurs, in their tax-related endeavors. With that, thank you, Professor Littman, for joining, and take it away. Great. Well, I'm excited to meet everyone, and what I hope you will take away from this uh, hour that we're going to spend together is everything you need to know about ITINs. ITIN is an acronym and it stands for Individual Taxpayer Identification Numbers. We're also going to cover EINs very briefly and I'll explain why we're going to cover it briefly. EINs is another acronym that stands for Employer Identification Number. I have uh, put up on the screen, and please do jot this down or just uh, write my name down, because the wonderful thing about the internet is if you just put my name in, a lot of my information will pop up. As Nicole said, I'm a law professor at UNLV. I teach tax law. I am not an immigration attorney, so I'm really not going to be able to answer immigration law questions, but the intersection of tax and, and law, immigration law is pretty rich, and therefore you need to, unfortunately, if your immigration status is something that you've had to focus on, you're going to have to focus on both. So do not hesitate. I say this, and I think anyone who interacts with me can affirm I'm very responsive to email. Don't hesitate to send me an email if you want to think about UNLV as a place where you might want to go to school. Uh, I'm proud to say we've got great programs for undocumented students. And think about law school. Um, I just watched a, a movie that I'm hoping Nicole, maybe when it comes out, a full documentary about a lawyer who was undocumented. And he, uh, I believe he's a dreamer now, but he argued in front of the Supreme Court. So the more the merrier. You have my email address now and Narf Nampil, uh, for those of you that like word games, you can see what that is. Uh, please don't hesitate to follow me on Twitter. I'm a top 100 tax Twitter account. And in case you couldn't see that, that is my name backwards, which is something my father used to do. And it annoyed me, but now I find it kind of cute. So what is an ITIN? Well, one big takeaway is an ITIN is a number that you use for tax reporting purposes. So it was created in 1996 because the federal government before that date, so this could include some of your parents or maybe even grandparents, before 1996, everyone, regardless of it, their immigration status, got social security numbers. And indeed, I work with some senior citizens, and frankly, they're not that old, uh, some folks who have social security numbers. They're their social security numbers, but they do not authorize work. Well, since 1996, the number, the taxpayer number that someone used to file taxes, if you do not qualify for a social security number, is an ITIN. It's easy to identify. It looks like a social security number in that it's nine digits and it has the dashes in the same spots that a social security number has. However, they all start with a nine. 
So anytime you see a number that looks like a social security number, but that starts with the nine, that is an ITIN. And that is for someone who doesn't presently qualify for a social security number. ITINs are issued in a letter. They used to be issued on a card, but then people confused it with a social security number. The link here, IRS publication 1915, that publication is readily available online and it has everything you need to know about ITINs. So never hesitate if you've got a question to pull that up and to look, work through it. So what is an EIN? Well, an employer identification number is the number that a business, a business owner that is going to employ individuals, individuals who are going to have employees. So for example, my employer UNLV has an employer identification number. That is so that they can report the earnings and the wages and payroll taxes for their employees. An EAN is used to identify a business entity for tax purposes. One of the conditions precedent to getting an EIN is you have to have a social security number or an ITIN. So I work with a lot of unauthorized uh, entrepreneurs, as Nicole has said, and unfortunately, they cannot get an EIN until you get your ITIN. So the first step is getting the ITIN. Then if you're going to start a business, then you get the EIN. Getting the EIN is incredibly easy. You can get it online uh, and you, you have to answer just a couple questions and you get the number immediately. So that's not a problem. It's much, much more challenging to get an ITIN. So why do people who are not legally present or, or who are not able to work because they don't have authorization why would they need a tax identification number? Well, the answer is that the United States, and this probably isn't going to surprise you, is a don't ask, don't tell, everybody's got to pay taxes, right? And so if you are physically present in the United States, regardless of your immigration status, and if you have U.S. source income, meaning you're employed in the U.S., you're working in the gig economy in the U.S., you're even getting scholarships that are above and beyond your tuition, you have taxable income. So regardless of your immigration status, if you are physically present for a certain period of time, you're subject to U.S. taxes on your worldwide income. Moreover, if you're a U.S. citizen, you're subject to tax, federal income tax on your worldwide income, even if you don't live in the U.S. or are no longer residing here. So once you become a U.S. citizen, for the rest of your life, regardless of where you earn it, regardless of where you're living, you're subject to U.S. income taxes. So the only way someone who's unauthorized can report this income, they don't qualify for a social security number, so they have to get an ITIN. For a long time, as you might have uh, re recalled, uh, and still today, there are a lot of people who say, well, unauthorized immigrants don't pay taxes. It's like, what are you talking about? Of course they pay taxes. And in fact, my goodness, most of us pay taxes every day through sales tax, through gas tax, through utility taxes, through all of the various taxes that we face on a regular basis. Well, 
you can't say, well, I'm unauthorized, so I don't have to pay those. No, as I said, if you are a U.S. citizen or a resident alien, you're subject to federal income taxes on your worldwide income. And I work with a lot of senior citizens and they'll say to me, Chris or Nicole or Cheyenne, anyone out there, Carla, they'll say, at what age can I stop paying taxes? And it's like, no, you have to pay taxes until you're six feet under. And in fact, even once you're gone, someone has to file your last income tax return on your behalf. Now, what if you are a non-resident, meaning a foreign investor in the U.S.? Well, guess what? They have to pay federal income taxes on their U.S. source income. So foreign investors who don't, who aren't physically present in the U.S., if they invest in U.S. businesses, they have to report that income and pay taxes. So the Internal Revenue Service is an equal opportunity, regardless of immigration status, subject, subjects you to taxes. So in order to be subject to tax on your worldwide income, you have to be something called a resident alien. That's the term straight out of the law. It's not the most pleasant term, but that's the legal term. So, and this is a resident for tax purposes, which is different than the way we use that term for immigration law purposes. So for tax purposes, you're a resident alien if you have a green card or if you pass the substantial presence test. So what is the substantial present test? Well, it's complicated, but it actually isn't. If you're physically present in the United States at least 31 days during the current year and 183 days during a three-year period, which includes the current year and we look at the two prior years, we count 100% of the current year days we only count one third of the days that were physically present in the prior year and one sixth of the days in the, in the uh, prior prior year. Well, you don't really have to even figure out that math. All that this means, because we don't have a porous border, most of the immigrants I work with other than temporary workers, farm laborers, once they come to the country, as many of you know from your own life story and your families, you're stuck here. We don't have a porous border. So once you come, you are likely for that first year, even if you come before July 1st, you're going to be subject to U.S. taxes on your worldwide income. And that is the case for so many immigrants. Now, certain students uh, at UNLV, we have a lot of foreign students, certain students, they might have visas, student visas. So when they're temporarily present here on these visas, they're generally treated as non-resident -res aliens. So they're exempt from social security taxes and Medicare taxes. So uh, for students who are foreign here coming on a visa, they get certain exemptions and they file to the extent they earn income here, they file as a non-resident. Well, how much do uh, unauthorized immigrants pay in taxes? Well, I've been writing about this and preaching about it for a long time. Billions with a B. ITIN filers, which is the number you use if you are not able to get a social security number, they pay about $18.1 billion in total federal income taxes every year. 
They also contribute to Social Security and Medicare, paying into these programs that they don't qualify for. If you are uh, not present uh, legally, you cannot collect Social Security or qualify for Medicare, but yet you have to pay into those systems. So anytime you're talking to people, this is important education process that yes, individuals are paying, unauthorized individuals are paying billions of dollars. And in fact, to uh, state and local governments and sales tax and gas taxes and in Las Vegas, gaming taxes pay almost $12 billion a year. Dreamers alone, by the way, dreamers do qualify for a social security number. They are, you know, temporarily able to work and they are uh, uh, excused from uh, their status on a temporary basis. So they do qualify for social security numbers. So they're paying $2 billion a year in state and local taxes. So unauthorized immigrants pay enormous amounts in state and local federal payroll taxes, tens of billions of dollars a year. They are a significant engine in our economy. And I think you certainly can know that from your own personal experience. So who uses an ITIN? Well, anyone who is a who has a green card and anyone who is uh, physically present who does not qualify for a social security number, they will be able to get an ITIN to the extent they have a tax filing requirement. In addition, if, if the parents are working and they have dependent children, perhaps one of you or one of your siblings or a spouse, they can also qualify for an ITIN. As I mentioned, foreign investors in U.S. businesses, they need to file a tax return so they get an ITIN. By the way, once a person has been issued an ITIN, if their status then affords them the opportunity to get a social security number and they get a social security number. So I've worked with some individuals who had an ITIN, then they qualified for uh, perhaps they got a green card, then they could get a social security number. Once you get a social security number, that is your number for life. That number perhaps may no longer be qualified for work. So let's suppose someone was unauthorized, then they got uh, DACA status, so they could, they qualified for a social security number, then perhaps DACA expires. So then their social security number no longer qualifies them for work. They will still use that social security number. They're not going to go back to the ITIN under current law. So it is complicated. Examples of people who need ITINs, as we said, someone who is not physically present, who's investing in the U.S., someone who is physically present here, a U.S. resident because of their physical presence and they have a tax filing obligation, a dependent or spouse of a U.S. citizen or a resident alien. So individuals, there's a myriad of individuals, but predominantly it is individuals who are in the U.S., who are working, perhaps not with authorization because they don't qualify for a social security number and they need to comply with tax responsibilities or foreign investors. As I said, if you're a DACA recipient, 
once you get your social security number, it's yours for life. You might lose your work authorization status, but you still use that social security number. Once a DACA recipient gets a social security number, they should let the IRS and the Social Security Administration know to transfer their work file from their ITIN to their social security number. So hopefully, that can be uh, you. Now, uh, as a law professor, I like to ask questions, right? I don't just like to sit there and chat all the time. So here's a pop quiz. I knew you didn't think I was going to ask you questions. Well, I am. So why don't you try this with me? And in the meantime, if you have any questions, ask them in the chat box and I will do my best to ask, answer them. So Ken enters the US in, 19, in 2020 with their parents. They don't qualify for a social security number. Ken is a freshman at UNLV and is working for the first time as an Uber driver. Are they subject to US taxes for their fiscal year? No, because they didn't meet the substantial presence test. No, unfortunately they did. They were in the US since 2020. Yes, because they passed the green card test. No, they don't have a green card. And my goodness, you all get A pluses. Yes, because they're a resident alien and subject to US taxes on their worldwide income. Good job. Maria, Liliana, Ariana, Jennifer, Ger Geraldine, Ashley, everybody's doing great. I should have had more questions. Now, again, you can ask me questions and I'll watch the chat. But anyway, yes, that was the answer. Yes, because they're a resident alien and subject to US taxes on their worldwide income. Very good. So what's an ITIN used for? ITINs are used by the holders and the IRS specifically as a means to pay your federal taxes. So you cannot file a tax return unless you have an ITIN. That's the bottom line. You cannot file a tax return without an ITIN. The IRS issues these numbers. So the IRS stands for Internal Revenue Service. It's the federal government. They issue them solely for this purpose. However, as you probably know, banks, uh, lenders, employers, dispute settlement companies, and a lot of schools will use your ITIN for identification purposes, even though the only reason it really exists is for tax reporting purposes. You cannot get an ITIN unless you have a tax obligation. More recently, state governments and I'm, I'm from Nevada. Nevada doesn't have a state income tax, but California does. And California, as well as many other states across the country, for COVID relief fund, they were allowing COVID economic impact payments to go to ITIN holders. So you, when you get an ITIN, you use it not just for federal reporting purposes, but also for state reporting purposes. So if you have a tax filing obligation, you must file your taxes. Why? It is a legal obligation as an employee, or if you're an Uber driver, or if you sell things on eBay, or if you have your own businesses, business, you need to comply with tax obligations. There are great tax credits for students. 
I'm happy to share that information with you. Uh, or you can find Google it for yourself on the look at it uh, for yourself at the IRS website. There's tax credits that subsidize higher education and ITIN holders qualify for that. Or if you're a parent and you have US citizen kids, you need to file tax returns in order to get a lot of benefits for your US citizen kids. I'm sure you know that during COVID, there were stimulus payments that only went to individuals who had social security numbers. However, even if parents didn't, they could file and get those for their kids. It also is going to help you for prospective immigration legalization. Income reporting is critical. Residents in the United States, it allows you to, um, it allows you to prove that you were physically present in the United States. And for some of you, perhaps you have to prove you are a resident of a certain state. So filing a state income taxes. So there's a couple of questions I'm gonna kind of look at. Your scholarships are not going to be considered income for tax purposes unless they exceed your tuition. So if you're lucky enough to get a scholarship that pays for more than your tuition, then you have to pick it up in income. If it only covers your tuition and required books, then it's not income. ITINs sometimes are used for credit checks or as someone asked, Candy asked for uh, background checks. That's an identification number. Uh, and can you become a lawyer with an ITIN? Well, uh, you can become a lawyer in certain states with an ITIN. That's a great question. And I believe you can in Nevada. And that is true. ITINs do not authorize a person to work in the US, but that doesn't say that an ITIN will not authorize you to have a US business, right? Um, and I don't know, Wagner, if you can be an anesthesiologist. That's a great question for an anesthesiologist. <laughs> uh, let's see. And so as you know, in order to have work authorization, you have to have a social security number. And so the ITIN doesn't authorize you to work. And so if you give that to an employer, that is not valid for work. And so that I guess is all I need to say on that. What's also important when you do apply to uh, normalize your status, Judges, immigration judges, look at filing tax returns as they look at filing tax returns as good moral characters. So, by the way, that seems to imply that it's bad moral character if you haven't filed your tax returns. And I will tell you that anyone who is going to eventually legalize their status, they have to demonstrate that they filed all their back tax returns. And if your DACA expires, you still use your social security number. Your social security number does not become an ITIN, but it no longer authorizes you for work, okay? Um, and yes, uh, someone asked Lorenzo, if you have an ITIN that your parents got you when they uh, prepared their tax returns, that is still your ITIN. So don't get a new one. Use that one. Okay. So now I'm going to go on, but I'm happy to answer any more questions. I'll keep my eyes on that. So a lot of you might be uh, concerned. A lot of you might be worried about filing tax returns because you think 
uh, the federal government then has your name, they've got your address, and perhaps uh, it's an admission against interest to file a tax return with an ITIN that has a W-2 on it with a social security number that is not yours. In any case, um, the good news is the federal government provides very strong confidentiality and on tax data. So there is a federal law that says the IRS cannot share that information except under certain investigations and for certain federal court orders. And so they can share it, but only for certain targeted investigations. And I will tell you, the federal government, especially the IRS, does not want to chill you from filing a tax return. They want you to file a tax returns. So the ITIN, when you apply for a job, the ITIN is not a social security number, so it doesn't authorize work. And so it doesn't qualify to show an employer that you can work. It is just for tax reporting purposes only. But if you have a tax filing obligation, you need an ITIN. So how the heck do you get an ITIN? Well, unfortunately, it is not that easy. As I was saying before, um, it's very easy to get an employer identification number, but to get an employer identification number, you have to have an ITIN or a valid social security number, a social security number that is yours. Do not apply for an employer identification number with someone else's social security number. Do not do that. So the first thing you need is an ITIN. How do you get one? Well, the form that you need to fill out is a W-7. W-7 as in Walter. It's on the IRS website. Here's the link, pull it up. It's one page. It looks very, very easy to fill out. The problem is, it is kind of challenging to fill out. And so what I'm gonna do is break it down for you. And here's the top of the W-7. If you don't have an ITIN, then you're applying for a new ITIN. So you check that box at the top. If you have an ITIN and it hasn't been used on a tax return, for three years, then you're going to have to renew your existing ITIN. And you do that on this same W7. Then on these boxes, you state the reason you're asking for the ITIN. You have to have a reason. And the reason most of you are going to qualify is item C. You are a U.S. resident alien based on the days present in the United States filing a U.S. tax return. So you're going to hit box C. Pretty easy. Then uh, you fill out your name, your name, your middle name, your last name, and then uh if you had a name that was different when you were born, let's suppose you're, you change your name, you got married or something like that, then you show your name uh, at birth. You put your street address, your mailing address, make sure the IRS only communicates with you through mail. They don't email, they don't call you, they send US snail mail. So make sure, make sure data hold, DACA holders, uh, I think you're saying Carla DACA holders. So a DACA, if you have DACA, you get a social security number. You're not filing for an ITIN if you have DACA, okay? So if you have DACA, you get a social security number. So you fill out your address, 
make sure this is an address that you are going to uh, be at because they will use that address until you tell them to change it. The next box three is a foreign address. You're likely not going to have that. Then your date of birth, your country of birth, city and, and or state uh, or province, that's optional. So anything that's optional, um, if anything is optional, then uh, don't fill it out is my suggestion. So here's somebody asking me, if you have DACA and then you lose DACA, you still use that social security number. You don't go back to an ITIN. You use that social security number for tax reporting purposes. Don't flip back and forth. The only progress is from an ITIN to a social security number. Once you have a social security number, you stick with that. Okay, then you put your gender, your country of citizenship, foreign ID number, if you have it, if you don't, you leave that alone, type of US visa, you're probably not gonna have a US visa, and then your identification document. For most of you, your identification document is going to be a valid current passport. You need at least two identification numbers. So Carla, if you have a social security number, you use that. You never go back to an ITIN. So that is a rule of thumb. If you have a social security number, you use the social, you don't get an ITIN. In fact, you can't get an ITIN if you have a social security number because the qualification for getting an ITIN is you can't get a social security number. Uh, so in order to get an ITIN, you've got to prove you exist and you also have to prove you are uh, not a US citizen. So you're going to show them your passport. I'm gonna tell you about other documents that qualify passports best. You're gonna put all the information from the passport. And then here's another question that often trips up people. The date of entry into the United States. As I said, I work with a lot of senior citizens and they can't remember the date. So we at least try to get the year and then I try to refresh their recollection. Was it hot? Was it cold? And we kind of guesstimate this day. I've never seen an I-10 application be rejected if that wasn't accurate, because frankly, the federal government doesn't know either. So just guesstimate this date, but you have to put a date there. Have you previously received an I-10? And so the answer should be no here. If you have an ITIN, then you're merely renewing it, and then you put down your ITIN uh, if you're renewing it. And box 6G is for uh, people who are here on student visas or faculty members. Then you're going to sign this. Uh, so it's actually pretty easy. Here's the problem, though. And by the way, this PowerPoint, which you need to register to get this PowerPoint, this PowerPoint is very important. So make sure you register on that little template that Nicole keeps putting in here. So here's the answer. Here's all the answers for that. And by the way, the instructions for the W7 it's 14 pages long. So as I said, as part of your application, you cannot get, now this is what's really gonna frustrate a lot of you. You cannot get an ITIN unless you have a tax reporting obligation. So you have to mail in your ITIN application, the W-7 with a completed tax return. You can't file it electronically. 
you have to file it in paper using mail. And you also have to use original documentation or certified copies in addition to your tax return and the W-7, you're gonna to have to prove you exist. And the best document to prove you exist is your passport. So you actually have to mail the federal government your passport, which is something that I wouldn't even want a US citizen to do. But I'm gonna tell you an alternative to mailing in the original document. But let me just show you the other documents. Hopefully all of you can get a current passport. So in, you have to prove two, and the tax return has to be from the, the tax year you file, right? It could be from a prior year. It could be a prior year that you haven't filed. So you have to prove your, your identity and your foreign status. So the passport proves both, but some things that prove your identity are a driver's license because that's got a picture of you. A foreign driver's license, which most of you are not gonna have. A state ID card. So if you can't get a driver's license, but you can get a state ID card, maybe that's okay. Or if you're in the military, a military ID card. The thing that most of you are going to have if you don't have a passport is a driver's license. Then you have to prove your foreign status. So that's going to be likely not a visa, likely not a uh, US citizen and immigration service photo, but maybe what you have is a birth certificate. So if you have a birth certificate that proves you're foreign born, and then you combine that with your driver's license, that can be in lieu of the passport, but the passport is the best document by far. Passport is the only document that proves both. Dependence from countries other than Canada, Mexico, or military dependents, they need an entry date on their passport. Uh, the good news is, and it is safe to use the passport, but, but uh, I think it's Norea. I worry about them losing it. So I'm gonna tell you an alternative. Uh, they're supposed to mail it back to you within 60 days, but I, I think it would make me nervous to mail it in. So I'm going to tell you about an alternative. Another way, if you have children, most of you do not have children, but if the children don't have photo IDs uh, because they don't drive, obviously they're not in school, they can use medical records or school records if they're under 18. So that could, that's often tough, but okay. How do you avoid submitting original documents? Well, the good news is you can use somebody called a certified acceptance agent. That's another acronym. So a certified acceptance agent, I happen to be one. It is someone who is authorized by the IRS and who is trained for forensically so that they can look at your documents and make sure that they're valid and they're not fraudulent. Okay, so find a certified acceptance agent. There is a link here that will help you find one on the IRS website. The problem is a lot of them charge money and you're not looking for an acceptance agent. You're looking for somebody who can authenticate your documents. And what these individuals do, they authenticate your documents and they say, yes, this is valid. I looked at the person, I looked at the documents and nothing's fraudulent, they exist. And then you don't have to mail in your passport. You just have this individual sign off on a document and you mail that in. So then you would have to mail in 
your tax return, your W-7, and the proof of authentication from the certified acceptance agent. Another option is you can go to the IRS Taxpayer Assistance Center. These are located throughout the country, but because the IRS is so backed up, they often don't have appointments, but you can try to make an appointment. So definitely use certified acceptance agents. There are some that are affiliated with VITA sites. So you can see here VITA sites, volunteer income tax assistance sites that offer certified acceptance agent services. So this is a link you wanna check out. They can prepare your tax return for free and also authenticate your documents. Another pop quiz, yay! Dimitri is documented and he works at a law office. Does he need to apply for an ITIN to file his taxes? Yes, no, only if his ITIN has expired. You're right, he's documented, so he qualifies for a social security number. Once you get a social security number, even if you lose your DACA status, your work authorization, you still use that social for the rest of your life. Good job. Now, another one. Juan lost his New York driver's license on a trip to Jones Beach last summer, but he has a student ID card, his Mexican passport, and a utility bill. Can he re renew his ITIN? No, because he needs to get a new license first. No. Yes, because his ID, NYC, and utility bill serve as proof of identity. No, yes, because his passport serves as proof of identity and foreign status. You got it. You guys all are getting A pluses. You gotta come in my law class. You're more responsive than my law students. Okay, ITIN renewals. Some of you were saying, so if you have an ITIN, can you get a driver's license? Abner, that depends upon state laws. Every state is different. So I don't know what state you're in, but check out the state laws. So somebody sent in their I-10 and guess what? Yep, there is a number, Geraldine, and you email me after this and I will get it from you. Abner, I don't know about Arizona, but you Google it and find out. Arizona might not allow people without a social security number to get a driver's license. You got to check it out. Uh, so ITINs, if you've had an ITIN, I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly because uh, we're running out of time. But basically, if you have an ITIN already and it was issued before 2013, Congress was really uh, worried about fraud. They didn't like all these ITINs out there. So they caused all the ITINs issued before 2013 to expire. And they made everybody renew their ITINs. By the way, if you had an ITIN and you haven't used it within the last three years, it's expired. But the good news is you can renew it. And when you renew it, you use the same number and you fill out the W-7. The good news is when you fill out the W-7, you do not have to include a tax return. Yay. So it's a lot easier. So you fill it out the same. Unfortunately, you have to submit documentation again, but you don't need an ITIN or you don't need a tax return. Maybe you got letters. The IRS sent people a lot of letters telling them their ITIN would expire. Um, in any case, if your ITIN has expired, 
you need to renew it. All you do is use that W7, you check the renew existing box, box and you put it on the, um, you put it in the, in the box that says, yes, I had an ITIN and this is the number. Anyone, if you have an ITIN and it's been used on a tax return in the last three years, or if it was issued after 2013, you don't have to uh, renew it. And if you don't have to file a tax return, you don't have to renew your ITIN, but you should all be uh, filing an ITIN. So you gotta, if you get a social security number, you should always file with the social security number. You should not use an ITIN. In fact, you can't get an ITIN if you have a social security number. Where can you get help? Well, the good news is there are lots of helpers like they're out there like me. And I can tell you got lots of questions. So I love this. You have to include original documents. You can go to a taxpayer assistance center, which is the IRS. You can use certified acceptance agents. Maybe you might have to pay something. Maybe it would be worth it if you had to pay. I don't know what your situation is, but make sure you know what the total amount is before you do agree to pay someone. The IRS has online free filing help. But if you don't have an ITIN, you're going to have to prepare your tax return online for free, then print it out and mail it in. There's also volunteer income tax assistance sites all across the country. I'm sure you qualify. So what you need to do is go to this link, enter your zip code, and they'll tell you where the VITA sites Another option is if you do not, if you're just confused and you can't find a VITA site or a taxpayer assistance center, look to see if there's a low income taxpayer clinic in your area, in your uh, zip code area. Click on this link and then you can call that low income taxpayer clinic. They might not be able to help you but they might be able to refer you to someone who can. So Nicole asked me to put together a little script. What do you say? Well, if you're calling one of these VITA sites or even a for pay preparer, you say, do you provide tax preparation and filing services for individuals with an individual taxpayer identification number? So this is what you ask for. If you don't want to say I'm unauthorized, you just say, do you provide tax prep and filing services for individuals with ITINs? And if they say yes, then you say, do you provide services to apply for an ITIN? And if they say yes, do you say, do those services include a certified acceptance agent who can authenticate documents? And if they say yes, you make an appointment ASAP. If it's a paid prepare, then you better ask them, how much do you charge for these services? And if you're happy with the fee, say, can I make an appointment, please and thank you. Your situation, if you don't have an ITIN yet, is gonna be more complicated. Do not wait until the last minute. If you're using a paid preparer, here are some tips. Make sure they give you a copy of your tax return and they sign it. There are a lot of unscrupulous tax preparers out there. Review the return to make, sh it sh make sure it makes sense. Make sure that it makes sense. If, uh, and make sure there's not anyone else's name on your tax return. And also open your mail and you can open an account online with the IRS to keep current on all the information that's there. One last quiz. 
Marissa is an ITIN filer whose ITIN is 951-810809. She's been living in the United States since 2010. Marissa earns $10,000 in 2022 and is a freshman at UNLV. Go Rebels. What do we know about Marissa's immigration status? Does she have a green card? No, because if she had a green card, then she would get a social security number. They're in the US on a tourist visa? No, because those individuals aren't going to be able to work. They don't have work authorization. We know that they are not a US citizen, right? And we also uh, know that they are likely undocumented, right? But we definitely, though, they're not a US citizen. So likely undocumented, and uh, but not necessarily, they are not a US citizen. Where can Marissa get help? The IRS Taxpayer Assistance Center, a certified acceptance agent, volunteer income tax assistance, social security office, no. A, B, and C, the social security office does not work on ITINs or on tax filings. Okay, if you have any questions that didn't get answered, you can certainly email me and follow me on Twitter. And if you want to start your own business, what I suggest you do is get an ITIN. You need to get an ITIN and what type of entity? Frankly, I would start off small and I would start off with just a sole proprietorship because that's low cost, low maintenance. Uh, you, Isabella, it doesn't sound, you really can't, an ITIN never goes to a company. An ITIN is an individual. So every individual needs an ITIN. And so if a lawyer has a business, then, and he doesn't qualify for a social security number, then he would have to use an ITIN. Now, most important takeaways, file taxes currently, be well-informed, don't be afraid, don't be afraid to go to the IRS website and download that procedure number 1915. It's got all the answers. There are helpers out there. Ask for help. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Lippman, for presenting today and talking to us about ITINs. We really appreciate it. And everyone, you can look out for an email with a recording, as well as a copy of the slide deck sometime early next week. We encourage everyone to attend our last session, which is this Thursday on healthcare career options, which will be presented by Yadi Ortez from Pre-Health Dreamers. Again, thank you everyone for attending and have a good rest of your day. Take care. Great questions, everyone, and you all get an A+.